Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Peter May. I'm the chairman of the Universities and Colleges Christian Fellowship, known as UCCF, and we have organized this two-week tour where Bill Craig will travel around the country visiting several universities engaged in either lectures or debates. Tonight is the opening event of this tour, and we're delighted that you've come out and braved the wet weather, which is a fairly grey evening outside the last I saw of it, and we look as though we have substantially filled the building. I have taken the liberty of deciding that we won't have, after the formal debate, we won't have questions from the floor. And there were big groans when I suggested that, but those of you who know John Humphreys well know that he asks good questions on behalf of the public. Seemingly almost every, the students may not know this because it's early in the morning of the Today programme. <laughs> But um, the older folk here know very well that John is always pitching in with the good questions, even handily, asking them both ways. And so the reason we have the three chairs set down here is for the latter part, after the formal debate, we're going to assemble our two debaters and John Humphreys, and they will have the best part of half an hour to tease out the issues further in a more conversational dialogue style. So have a row with you. John's already getting a bit uppity. I suspect it'll be a row. <laughs> I'm sure it's going to be a very gentlemanly conversation. Church historian David Edwards wrote this. The gospel comes alive when it's being tested against needs and against rivals. He wrote that Christianity grows strong in the open air. And the whole thrust of this two weeks is to bring it into open forum where people can bring their own objections, viewpoints, disagreements, and debate will form a, a very important part of it, and question times will be a, a key feature of everything that we do. So finally, it remains for me to introduce our chairman for tonight. I have already suggested. It, it is interesting with celebrities like John, and some of us feel we know him so well. He it comes into our home uh, almost every morning. Those of you who are not up early enough will know him from Mastermind, uh, which he regularly presents on BBC television. Besides his radio journalism and his television work, he's also an author and a broadsheet journalist. So I imagine that he is familiar to most of us, and it is now my uh, great pleasure to introduce who will then introduce our debaters tonight. Please welcome the mastermind presenter, John Humphreys. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. Thank you very much. I am, I'm, I'm particularly grateful that you mentioned mastermind. It has to be said, because it's relatively new for me that I thought I, I wasn't going to try anything new ever again and then they asked me about three years ago whenever it was to do mastermind so I thought I'd give it a go and it's wonderful I, I mean I, not necessarily the program I've never actually seen the program but it but <laughs> but I can't tell you, particularly since we're here in Westminster, how wonderful it is, because for all of my career, and most of my career, I've been a hack for nearly 50 years, mostly I've been interviewing politicians. And now I'm chairing a quiz, and I'm talking to people who actually want to answer the question. <laughs> it, it, it is a, the ultimate cultural shock, I tell you. But you do admittedly get some fairly bizarre answers to some of the, we, we, you know, we may, you may know, we do this celebrity mastermind thing, and, and it has to be said that the people invited on to celebrity mastermind are not necessarily, not necessarily the brightest coins in the mint, not, not all of them anyway. And we had one on, I'm not sure whether they broadcast the program yet, but we had one on where I, yeah, we always kick off with a couple of easy questions, you know, to get them in the mood and all that. And I asked one of them, um, as the opening question, what uh, breakfast cereal do you associate with prison? No, oh. no, yeah, yeah, quite so. Yeah, you know what he said? Cheerios. <laughs> Which, <laughs> I, there is a point to it, isn't there? You can see it, you know. Maybe he was just commenting on the government's policy towards our... Anyway, I don't know. Uh, 
enough, enough of that. We want to get on to the debate. I don't want to hold you back from these two esteemed gents. You know them, of course, otherwise you wouldn't be here. Um, at least I assume you wouldn't be here if you didn't know them. Uh, you know Will Craig, William Lane Craig, to give him his, uh, his time. I'm not going to run through his CV or anything. That's too boring for words. You know who he is, what he's done, what he, what he believes in. What you may not know, and I discovered this this morning, and he may deny this, of course, but too late now, is, is how he actually got to believe in God. And, and it, it all has to do with a rather beautiful young redhead at the age of 15. I mean, <laughs> who sat in front of him in class. You know, I go no further than that. I'll leave it to him to see how much of that he's, he's prepared to vouchsafe to you. What can I say about Lewis? A regular fixer, I'm delighted to say on the Today program. He is, he is a great adornment to, our, to the national scene. Indeed, he's essential, in my view, to the national scene. You know him? Well, at least if you don't, you should acquaint yourself with his work. Buy his book, Six Impossible Things Before Breakfast, because it's terrific. Well, I think it's terrific, but there we are. Um, he had a faith until he was 15. He was Jewish. Well, he is Jewish. Of course, you don't stop being Jewish. But he, he practiced his faith until he was about 15, lived in South Africa, left South Africa, no longer believes as you know, um, and no doubt he will tell us uh, why. However, we're going to kick off uh, with uh, Bill, and the deal is this. They get 20 minutes each, then there's a rebuttal, 10 minutes each, then there's a rebuttal of the rebuttal, seven minutes each, and then there's a five-minute sort of summary. So that's how it's going to work. Ten, 20 minutes, 10 minutes, seven minutes, and five minutes. That's, uh, that's the deal. And then at the end of all that, um, we will sit together, the three of us, and... Um, see if there are any other issues to explore or perhaps make it a little more personal, possibly even animated, though I dare say they'll be perfectly animated while they're here at the lectern. So, would you first welcome, please, Bill Craig. Thank you, John. Thank you, and good evening. I want to begin by expressing my thanks to UCCF for inviting me to participate in tonight's debate. And I also want to say what a real privilege it is to be sharing the podium with Dr. Wolpert this evening. And of course, I want to thank all of you for coming out to share this evening with us. It's my hope that our discussion tonight will be a genuine practical help to you as you work through these issues yourself personally. Now, in asking the question, is God a delusion? It's imperative right from the start that we clearly define our terms. The dictionary definition of a delusion is a false belief or opinion. Therefore, if Professor Wolpert is to persuade us that belief in God is a delusion, he must show that belief to be false. Accordingly, in tonight's debate, I'm going to defend two basic contentions. First, there's no good reason to think that belief in God is false. And secondly, there are good reasons to think that belief in God is true. Consider then my first contention that there's no good reason to think that belief in God is false. Now, I'm going to leave it up to Dr. Wolpert to present arguments against God's existence, and then I'll respond to them in my next speech. But I want to simply note in passing that if he's to justify an affirmative answer to the question before us this evening, then he does owe us such arguments. So let's turn then to my second main contention, that there are good reasons to think that belief in God is true. However unfashionable it may appear, I am actually convinced that there really are good reasons to believe that God exists. And let me just sketch tonight briefly some of those reasons. Number one, God is the best explanation of the origin of the universe. Have you ever asked yourself where the universe came from? Why anything at all exists instead of just nothing? Well, typically atheists have said that the universe is just eternal and uncaused. But there are good reasons, both philosophically and scientifically, to doubt that this is the case. Philosophically, the idea of an infinite past seems absurd. If the universe never had a beginning, that means that the number of past events in the history of the universe is infinite. But mathematicians recognize that the existence of an actually infinite number of things leads to self-contradictions. For example, 
what is infinity minus infinity? Well, mathematically, you get self-contradictory answers. This shows that infinity is just an idea in your mind, not something that exists in reality. David Hilbert, perhaps the greatest mathematician of the 20th century, writes, the infinite is nowhere to be found in reality. It neither exists in nature nor provides a legitimate basis for rational thought. The role that remains for the infinite to play is solely that of an idea. But that entails that since past events are not just ideas but are real, the number of past events must be finite. Therefore, the series of past events can't go back and back forever. Rather, the universe must have begun to exist. This conclusion has been confirmed by remarkable discoveries in astronomy and astrophysics. In one of the most startling developments of modern science, we now have pretty strong evidence that the universe is not eternal in the past, but had an absolute beginning about 13 billion years ago in a cataclysmic event known as the Big Bang. What makes the Big Bang so special is that it represents the origin of the universe from literally nothing. As the physicist PCW Davies explains, the coming into being of the universe, as discussed in modern science, is not just a matter of imposing some sort of organization upon a previous incoherent state, but literally the coming into being of all physical things from nothing. The Big Bang thus marks the origin not only of all the matter and energy in the universe, but of physical space and time themselves. Now, of course, alternative theories have been crafted over the years to try to avert the beginning predicted by the standard model. But none of these has commended itself to the scientific community as more plausible than the Big Bang Theory. In fact, in the year 2003, Arvind Bord, Alan Guth, and Alexander Vilenkin were able to prove that any universe which has on average been in a state of cosmic expansion cannot be eternal in the past, but must have an absolute beginning. Vilenkin pulls no punches. I quote, it is said that an argument is what convinces reasonable men, and a proof is what it takes to convince even an unreasonable man. With the proof now in place, cosmologists can no longer hide behind the possibility of a past eternal universe. There is no escape. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning. That problem was nicely captured by Anthony Kenney of Oxford University. He writes, a proponent of the Big Bang Theory, at least if he is an atheist, must believe that the universe came from nothing and by nothing. But surely that doesn't make sense. Out of nothing, nothing comes. Such a conclusion is, in the words of philosopher of science, Bernhard Kanitscheider, in head-on collision with the most successful ontological commitment in the history of science, namely the principle, out of nothing, nothing comes. So why does the universe exist instead of just nothing? Where did it come from? There must have been a transcendent cause which brought the universe into being. We can summarize our argument thus far as follows. One, whatever begins to exist has a cause. Two, the universe began to exist. Three, therefore, the universe has a cause. Now, as the cause of space and time, this being must be an uncaused, timeless, spaceless, immaterial being of unfathomable power. Moreover, it must be personal as well. Why? Well, first of all, because this event must be beyond space and time. Therefore, it cannot be physical or material. Now, there are only two kinds of things that fit that description, either abstract objects like numbers or an intelligent mind. But abstract objects can't cause anything. Therefore, it follows that the cause of the universe is a personal, transcendent mind. Secondly, 
How else could a timeless cause give rise to a temporal effect like the universe? If the cause were an impersonal set of necessary and sufficient conditions, then the cause could never exist without its effect. If the cause were permanently present, then the effect would be permanently present as well. The only way for the cause to be timeless and the effect to begin in time is for the cause to be a personal agent who freely chooses to create an event in time without any antecedent determining conditions. And thus we are brought not merely to a transcendent cause of the universe, but to its personal creator. Number two, God is the best explanation of the fine tuning of the universe for intelligent life. In recent decades, scientists have been stunned by the discovery that the initial conditions of the Big Bang were fine-tuned for the existence of intelligent life with a precision and delicacy that literally defy human comprehension. This fine-tuning is of two sorts. First, when the laws of nature are given mathematical expression, you find appearing in them certain constants, like the gravitational constant. These constants are not determined by the laws of nature. The laws of nature are consistent with a wide range of values for these constants. Second, in addition to these constants, there are certain arbitrary quantities which are just put in as initial conditions on which the laws of nature operate. For example, the amount of entropy or the balance between matter and antimatter in the universe. Now, all of these constants and quantities fall into an extraordinarily narrow life-permitting range. Were these constants or quantities to be altered by even a hair's breadth, a life-permitting balance would be destroyed and life would not exist. For example, if the atomic weak force or the force of gravity were altered by as little as one part out of 10 to the 100th power, the universe would not have been life permitting. Now, there are only three possible explanations of this extraordinary fine tuning, physical necessity, chance, or design. Now, it can't be due to physical necessity because as we've seen, the constants and quantities are independent of the laws of nature. In fact, string theory predicts that there are around 10 to the 500th power different universes compatible with nature's laws. So could the fine tuning be due to chance? Well, the problem with this alternative is that the odds against the fine tunings occurring by accident are so incomprehensibly great that they cannot be reasonably faced. The probability that all the constants and quantities would fall by chance alone into the narrow life-permitting range is vanishingly small. We now know that life-prohibiting universes are vastly more probable than any life-permitting universe like ours. So if the universe were the product of chance, the odds are overwhelming that the universe would be life-prohibiting. Hence, we may argue as follows. Premise one, the fine-tuning of the universe is due to either physical necessity, chance, or design. Two, it is not due to physical necessity or chance. Three, therefore, it is due to design. And thus, the fine-tuning of the universe for intelligent life implies the existence of a designer of the cosmos. Three, God is the best explanation of objective moral values in the world. If God does not exist, then objective moral values do not exist. By objective values, I mean values which are valid and binding independently of whether anybody believes in them or not. And many theists and atheists alike agree that if God does not exist, then moral values are not objective in this sense. For example, Michael Roos, a noted philosopher of science, writes, the position of the modern evolutionist is that morality is a biological adaptation, no less than our hands and feet and teeth. Considered as a rationally justifiable set of claims about an objective something, ethics is illusory. I appreciate that when somebody says, love thy neighbor as thyself, they think they are referring above and beyond themselves. Nevertheless, such reference is truly without foundation, 
Morality is just an aid to survival and reproduction, and any deeper meaning is illusory. Like Professor Roos, I just don't see any reason to think that in the absence of God, the morality evolved by Homo sapiens is objective. On the atheistic view, some actions, say rape, may not be socially advantageous, and so in the course of human development has become taboo. But that does absolutely nothing to prove that rape is morally wrong. On the atheistic view, there's nothing really wrong with your raping someone. But the problem is that objective values do exist, and deep down I think we all know it. There's no more reason to deny the objective reality of moral values than the objective reality of the physical world. Actions like rape, cruelty, and child abuse aren't just socially unacceptable behavior, they're moral abominations. Roos himself admits, and I quote, the man who says it is morally acceptable to rape little children is just as mistaken as the man who says two plus two equals five, end quote. Some things, at least, are really wrong. Similarly, love, equality, and self-sacrifice are really good. Hence, our argument can be summarized as follows. One, if God does not exist, objective moral values do not exist. Two, but objective values do exist, and therefore it follows logically and inescapably that three, therefore God exists. Number four, the historical facts concerning the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus imply God's existence. The historical person, Jesus of Nazareth, was a remarkable individual. New Testament critics have reached something of a consensus that the historical Jesus came on the scene with an unprecedented sense of divine authority, the authority to stand and speak in God's place. He claimed that in himself the kingdom of God had come, and as visible demonstrations of this fact, he carried out a ministry of miracle working and exorcisms. But certainly the supreme confirmation of his claim was his resurrection from the dead. If Jesus really did rise from the dead, then it would seem that we have a divine miracle on our hands and thus evidence for the existence of God. Now, most people would probably think that the resurrection of Jesus is something you just believe in by faith or not. But in fact, there are actually three established facts recognized by the majority of New Testament historians today, which I believe are best explained by the resurrection of Jesus. Fact number one, on the Sunday following his crucifixion, Jesus' tomb was found empty by a group of his women followers. According to Jakob Kramer, an Austrian specialist in the study of the resurrection, by far most scholars hold firmly to the reliability of the biblical statements about the empty tomb. Fact number two, on separate occasions, different individuals and groups saw appearances of Jesus alive after his death. According to the prominent New Testament critic Gerald Ludemann, it may be taken as historically certain that the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ. These appearances were witnessed not only by believers, but also by unbelievers, skeptics, and even enemies. Fact number three, the original disciples suddenly came to believe in the resurrection of Jesus, despite having every predisposition to the contrary. Two minutes. Jews had no belief in a dying, much less rising Messiah, and Jewish beliefs about the afterlife precluded anyone's rising from the dead to glory and immortality before the end of the world. Nevertheless, the original disciples came to believe so strongly that God had raised Jesus from the dead that they were willing to die for the truth of that belief. N.T. Wright, an eminent New Testament scholar, has concluded, that is why, as an historian, I cannot explain the rise of early Christianity unless Jesus rose again, leaving an empty tomb behind him. Attempts to explain away these three great facts, like the disciples stole the body or Jesus wasn't really dead, have been universally rejected by contemporary scholarship. The fact is that there just is no plausible naturalistic explanation of these facts. 
And therefore, it seems to me, the Christian is amply justified in believing that Jesus rose from the dead and was who he claimed to be. One minute left. But that entails that God exists. And thus, we have a sound inductive argument for the existence of God. Finally, number five, God can be immediately known and experienced. This isn't really an argument for God's existence. Rather, it's the claim that you can know that God exists wholly apart from arguments, simply by immediately experiencing him. This was the way people in the Bible knew God. As Professor John Hick explains, God was known to them as a dynamic will interacting with their own wills, a sheer given reality as inescapably to be reckoned with as destructive storm and life-giving sunshine. To them, God was not an idea adopted by the mind, but an experienced reality which gave significance to their lives. Now, if this is the case, then arguments for the existence of God could actually distract us from God himself. If you're sincerely seeking God, then God will make his existence evident to you. The Bible promises, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. And therefore, I think we have good grounds for thinking that belief in God is not a delusion. Thank you. Professor Lewis Wolpert, 20 minutes. <clears throat> well, thank you very much. Um, I'm not sure that I really want to thank the organizers for asking me to do this. <laughs> <laughs> it's, quite a, it's quite a complex issue. And, and let me try and explain to you why. The vast majority of you here, we've worked out something like 90%, um, believe in God and are religious. I am not against people being religious. I think it helps you a great deal. I'm against religion when it interferes in the lives of other people. Um, I'm very happy to discuss this. I'm not, in other words, if you believe, for example, that the fertilized egg is really a human being, which some people in religious organizations believe, then I'm very hostile to you because it's nonsense. This is one of my subjects, developmental biology. Or if, for example, you're against contraception for religious reasons, and therefore AIDS, as it were, can become more common. So I'm not against people having a belief in God. I do believe that that belief is false. And I'm saved by the fact that whatever arguments I give you, I have no illusion, I have no delusion, that I will persuade you to change your minds. Beliefs are like possessions, and I ask you, when did you really last give up a basic belief or your partner or your parent or your child? It's very hard to do so. Now, just let me remind you a nice statement from Richard Dawkins, who's been mentioned already. He points out that in talking about God, there exists a superhuman, supernatural intelligence who deliberately designed and created the universe and everything in it, including us. Now, if you believe that, and many of you do believe that, you feel better. And that, I regret to tell you, is why you believe in it. And that really is the origin of religion. People who have religious beliefs are on the whole healthier. Not much healthier, don't get, don't get carried away by it. <laughs> But you do do better, you, 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 on the whole you do better. Also belonging to a religious community, there's no doubt about it, can have great advantages. I'm not so, I don't want to argue that religion is always good, I don't want to get involved in religious wars and something like that. But the real point is, it provides an explanation of a very deep problem, and that's why we are here at all. Now, the problem about believing in God is looking for evidence. I regret to tell you, and we won't have a discussion with you later, but I will later on, there is zero evidence for the existence of God. I'm terribly sorry, there, there just isn't. Now, first of all, just let me remind you that every culture in the world, hundreds of them, have gods of some sort. You are focused on the Christian God, but may I ask what's wrong with their gods? I mean, why do you think that your God, and I assume you're all Christian gods, why do you think your God is sort of better based than, all, than theirs? And there's a very nice story from um, 
someone who works on religion, an anthropologist called Pascal Boyer. And he was at a dinner in Oxford. Maybe it was Cambridge, it doesn't really matter, but a smart English place. <laughs> And he was telling them about a group he'd been studying in Southern Africa who believed that there were witches who flew over the territory there and killed some of their cattle. And the head of the college said, how can people have such absurd ideas? Isn't it ridiculous? And Pascal didn't have the courage to tell them that these people knew about Christianity and had often asked him, why was it that the people in Christianity was still suffering because a couple of their ancestors had eaten some fruit. <laughs> Please don't think that your ideas about the nature of pain and suffering are all that different from religions in other parts of the world. Now, the other problem with actually finding evidence for God is to actually to give some evidence. But the first problem is, if God exists, who created God? And why has God got a human form? You know, I think God would be, if there were a God, I'm sure he'd be much more imaginative than to be like one of us. Good Lord, would he have backache? Yeah, I mean, that he should take on a human form is natural from a historical point of view, because that, as I'll explain in a moment. But to, to think that God who might have done all these things was human seems to me bizarre in the extreme. And of course, there's zero evidence for it. Let me try and explain to you, you won't like it one bit, as to why you actually believe in God. First of all, it makes you feel better. You have someone to pray to. And the historical origin of this really goes back to your ancient ancestors, oh, a couple of million years ago. A couple of million years ago, humans, our ancestors, started making tools. You know, you've all seen those little stone tools. Now, making them, animals can't do that. It, Please don't tell me how clever your dogs and cats are. Really, they're not as clever as you think they are. And I know there are repeated articles in the papers how gorillas and chimps are wonderful tool makers. They can actually take a stick and actually get some ants out of a tree. But, you know, it's pretty limited. <laughs> but humans started making tools, and in order to make tools, you have to have a concept of physical cause and effect. And what makes you human is not God, but your causal beliefs. You have a concept of physical cause and effect, and that led to tool making and technology, and that is what drove human evolution. And as someone pointed out, to get a feel of the difference between you and animals, imagine seeing a tree, oh, sorry, imagine seeing a wind blowing a tree and some fruit falling off. You would perfectly well know that in order to get that fruit, all you would have to do is to shake the tree. We believe that no animal seeing that would have the foggiest notion that if they shook the tree, the fruit would fall off. They could learn to shake the tree if they did it by accident, but they could never actually intuitively do that. It's a slightly controversial field, but really what makes you human is the concept of cause and effect. Now, when that happened, and the I don't have to tell you the advantage of having tools. There are all sorts of people that think that human evolution is really based upon humans understanding each other. I think chimpanzees and baboons have quite a good understanding of what's going on. It's really quite a, quite a reasonable society. And can I just point out to you, if you think it's social relationships that really matter, if you had to go into the jungle, whom would you or what would you rather take with you? A friend or an axe? Hmm. I'd take an X if I were you. <laughs> However, once people had a concept of cause and effect, they wanted to understand other things. They wanted to understand why the sun went around the earth. Of course it doesn't. <laughs> uh, they wanted to understand why we got ill, and particularly we want to understand why we died. And in fact, we wanted to understand everything. Now, the one cause they were absolutely sure of was a cause made by another human being. And that's why they invented gods with human characteristics. And so I'm sorry to tell you, you won't like it, it's not attractive, that the origin of religion comes from tool making. It comes from a concept of cause and effect. And those people who had such beliefs in religion, first of all, had a great advantage. First of all, they no longer worried about many of these problems as you don't, 
because you know why we're here, because God put us here. And it provided explanations for ill health, death, the afterlife, and, and everything else. And it had the other advantage, you could pray to that God. And prayer is very comforting, even though it may not lead anywhere. It nevertheless, it's very comforting. It does offer you something to do. And I think that those people who became, I think of those people who became religious survive better. And I would like to argue quite persuasively that you have a bit, not a God gene in your brain, but a propensity to believe in religion is embedded in the neural circuits in our brain and controlled by our genes. Because those people who became religious survived better. And my evidence, my evidence that we do have that is the following. First of all, just can I remind you that many people have actually religious experiences. A wonderful book is by, oh gosh, um, William James, The Varieties of Religious Experience, in which he points out that many people have religious experiences which are as real for them as anything in their real life. They are, of course, delusions, but nevertheless, they are real for them. And these are, I'm afraid, in one's brain. And let me just tell you why I think these circuits are there. If, for example, you've just been isolated recently, the active ingredient of magic mushroom, and if you take a group of people, particularly those who have some religious inclination and give them this active ingredient, many of them afterwards have religious experiences or religious-like experience. And people do have mystical experiences. If you just, I mean, I'm not gonna ask you to put up your hands. I would be absolutely amazed if something like 10% of you have not had some strange experience, certainly out of touch with the real world over the last year, and that's what most surveys show. And you have to ask yourself, why if you take LSD, you know, and, and if, you, if you have a look what Timothy Leary and people say, you know, they believe they actually were God, they believe they were the universe. It can't be this boring molecule that turns on these feelings. It must mean that they're activating these circuits in your brain. I'm sorry to tell you, you and all human beings have quite a strong set of mystical circuits in your brain. And it comes, I would want to argue, from the fact that those people who believed in religion and mysticism survived better in our ancestors than those who did not. So that's, you know, I think one way of thinking about, um, the, 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 uh, about the origin of, of religion. It's not easy, I mean, I can't guarantee you that all these things that I'm saying, because I'm talking about things that happened tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe even a million years ago, but at least I think it makes a plausible story. Because I think when one comes to the existence of God, you have to ask once again who created God. You see, if you're going to go for causal effects, so there's a God, then you have to say, but sorry, where did God come from? It's not a question I hear often answered. God, where did you come from? Not even God answers that. And it's bizarre to have a human like God who has no cause for his own creation. And you really, if you go to the Bible now, must I really take seriously that women came from Adam's rib? I'm terribly sorry, I'm a developmental biologist and I am a biologist, I want to tell you, Women, yes, women are peculiar. There's no question about that. But they did not come from Adam's rib. Whatever their peculiarities are, it's not because of the rib-like nature of their ancestry. That I can tell you. I think you also have to remember, and this is a slightly delicate area, that the stories about and the Gospels about Jesus were written 30 to 40 to 50 years after his death. No one who wrote the Gospels actually observed any of the events that they are writing about. That's my reading of the actual, of the, uh, 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 of the actual stories um, uh, uh, as, 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 I, as, I, as I look at, at the literature. And you don't have to worry too much about morals. You see, even chimpanzees are quite kind to each other. They, they can cooperate, and, and, and so can gorillas. And you don't have to have a moral sense from some supernatural being whose creation we don't understand. 
Evolutionists have looked at this quite clearly. People like Trivers and Hamilton have pointed out that we have in our genes, no, that our genes program us to behave really quite well, particularly to those who share similar genes. And there's also evidence that humans behave quite well. If you're kind to me, on the whole, I'll be kind to you. If you're nasty to me, I'm afraid I'm going to turn against you. And this makes for a perfectly reasonable um, a, a moral position without, without any difficulty whatsoever. And if you come to all the complexity, and I mean I know the origin of life is a, is a tricky issue, but evolution Evolution's really very clever. No, it's not clever, it's really very dim, to put it bluntly, but it achieves remarkable results. Randomness and selection can get you to remarkable positions. This is not, not the moment for, for me to give you, uh, give you a, 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 lec a, a lecture on evolution. But just remember, evolution proceeds very slowly. And I think that anybody thinks that God created you what about all that evolution? You don't believe that you descended from apes? Just look at some of your friends, aren't they? But come on, <laughs> you know exactly what I mean. You must be dotty not to think that. I think for the moment, let me then just sum up again. I think the evidence for God is simply non-existent. Yes, there is some evidence for God in the Bible, but that was nearly 2,000 years ago, and I keep asking my religious friends, could you please tell me what God has done in the last 2,000 years? And there's a mumbling and a bumbling, but no answer whatsoever. Thank you very much. Bill? Ten-minute rebuttal. You'll remember in my opening speech, I said that I would defend two basic contentions in tonight's debate. The first of those was that there's no good reason to think that belief in God is false. Now, as I listened to that first speech by Professor Wolpert, I discerned basically three arguments that he gave to show that belief in God is false. The first one is that people are religious because they feel better, and that's why they believe in God. Or alternatively, it is because of the human concept of causality that leads them to believe in God. It may, in fact, be hardwired into their brain. Now, the problem with this sort of argument is that if you say that because belief in God is occasioned or caused in this way, therefore that belief is false, you commit an elementary logical fallacy known to every intro to philosophy student called the genetic fallacy. The genetic fallacy is trying to invalidate a point of view by showing how that view originated. And the fact that beliefs arise through people's wanting to feel better or perhaps through causality or even being hardwired into the brain does nothing to prove that those beliefs are false, which is what he must prove if he's to show belief in God as a delusion. For example, it's been shown by child psychologists that children have hardwired into them the belief that when an object they see disappears behind a screen and then reappears, they believe that the object continues to exist when it goes out of sight. It doesn't disappear from being and then pop back into being. This is a hardwired belief in children, and yet I think none of us would say, therefore, that belief is false. Now, the fact is that uh, some uh, child psychology studies do indicate that children also have such an instinctive belief in God, and I'm inclined to view this as God's provision. Now, the skeptic, like Dr. Wolpert, thinks that this is a delusion. But then if he's to justify his view, he owes us some argument to show that the belief is false. Otherwise, he's committing the genetic fallacy. So the issue tonight before us in the debate is not how religious beliefs originate, it is whether or not those beliefs are true or false. Now, he does give a second argument designed to prove that God does not exist, and that is that there's no evidence for God's existence. Well, this is not a good argument, frankly, because in the words of uh, a forensic scientist I once met in Australia, the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Just because there's no evidence that the butler was the murderer doesn't mean that the butler was not the murderer. Or to give a scientific example, we have no evidence so far that there was an early inflationary era in the origin of the cosmos. But woe be to the cosmologist 
who says because we don't have any evidence of it, therefore it did not exist. Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. He needs to give a positive argument against God's existence. Now his third argument that he offered was the simple question, who created God? Well, this is not at all difficult to answer. A timeless, eternal being cannot have a cause. As Keith Ward points out in his book, God, Chance, and Necessity, if one asks what caused God, the answer is that nothing could bring into being a reality which wholly transcends space-time and which is self-existent. To fail to grasp such an idea is to fail to grasp what God is. Moreover, I have given an argument that there exists such a being, namely my first argument based upon the beginning of the universe. It leads us to the postulation of a timeless, spaceless, immaterial, and uncaused eternal being. So none of these arguments is any good that he's given us against the existence of God. If he's going to answer affirmatively that belief in God is a delusion, then we've got to see some better arguments in favor of that proposition. Now what about the arguments that I gave? My first argument was based upon the origin of the universe, and apart from the who created God question, I saw no response to this argument in his first speech. What about the argument based upon the fine-tuning of the universe? Again, there was no response to that, but let me reinforce this argument by dealing with a possible objection that often arises. Many times people will say, well, maybe our universe is just one of an infinite number of parallel universes, a sort of world ensemble, and by chance alone we appear somewhere in the ensemble, and therefore we shouldn't be surprised at the fine-tuning of the universe. The reason this objection does not work, as pointed out by Roger Penrose at Oxford University, is that if our universe were just a random member of a world ensemble of randomly ordered worlds, then it is far, far more probable that we would be observing a vastly different universe than what we do observe. For example, the chances of our, our solar systems forming instantaneously by random collision of particles is about one out of 10 to the 10 to the 60th. Now that number is an inconceivably large number, but as Penrose says, it is, it is incomprehensibly smaller than the improbability that the low entropy level of our universe, which is fine-tuned for our existence, should exist by chance. Therefore, if we were just one of a randomly ordered uh, world ensemble, we should be observing a much, much smaller universe. The fact that we do not, therefore, disconfirms very strongly the world ensemble hypothesis, which suggests that we are not here due to chance. Rather, as I said, we're here due to design. My third argument was based upon moral values in the world. You remember I argued if there is no God, then there are no uh, objective moral values. And many atheists agree with this. For example, Richard Dawkins in his recent book is quoted by Professor Wolpert approvingly when uh, Dawkins says, there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but pointless indifference. We are machines for propagating DNA. It is uh, every living object's sole reason for living. Now, the problem is that that is inconsistent with Dr. Wolpert's own statements of moral value, such as that religion should not interfere with the lives of others. That is a moral judgment on his part. So it seems to me he's caught in a contradiction of on the one hand saying there are no objective moral values on an atheistic evolutionary view, but on the other hand agreeing with me and I think with most of us that in fact there are objective moral values. Torturing a child for fun is objectively morally wrong. And if you agree with that, then I think you'll agree with me that God exists. Fourthly, I spoke of the evidence for the resurrection of <laughs> Jesus. And here Dr. Wolpert responded to my evidence for the empty tomb, the resurrection appearances, and the origin of uh, the Christian faith by saying that the Gospels were written later and they're not based on eyewitness testimony. I'm afraid that's just misinformed. Uh, in uh, the review of John Dominic Crossan's book, The Birth of Christianity, in the Journal of the American Academy of Religion published in the fall of 2000, the uh, reviewer writes, the dominant, and in my mind, the likely view is that the passion narratives are early and based on eyewitness testimony. Specifically, with regard to the empty tomb and the appearances, N.T. Wright in his epical book, The Resurrection of the Son of God, 
has concluded that the empty tomb and appearances have a historical probability so high as to be virtually certain, like the death of Augustus in AD 14 or the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70. Those are the facts. The only real question is how do you best explain them? And I have never seen a naturalistic explanation of these facts that is as probable or plausible as the resurrection of Jesus. Finally, what about my argument based on the personal experience of God? Here Dr. Wolpert says, well, there are varieties of religious experience. Certainly there are. And I would say that a person is justified in believing in the object of his religious experience unless he has an overriding defeater or reason for thinking that that experience is delusory. The problem is in tonight's debate, we haven't been given any good reasons for thinking that belief is delusory. So it seems to me I'm perfectly rational to believe in God on the basis of my personal experience of God unless and until he can give me some good reason for thinking that that experience is delusory. He says, well, what has God done in the last 2,000 years? Well, for one thing, he changed my life. Uh, I've had a personal experience of God, uh, and uh, I see no reason to doubt the ver verticality of that experience. Um, so the belief in the existence of God, like the belief in the external world or the belief in the reality of the past, uh, is a rational belief to hold unless and until someone provides some sort of overriding objection. So I think so far in tonight's debate, we've not seen any good reasons to think that the belief in God is false. We've seen the genetic fallacy, we've seen red herrings uh, and other uh, inconclusive arguments. On the other hand, I think we've got five good reasons, all of which point to the existence of a transcendent creator and designer of the universe who is the locus of absolute value, who has revealed himself in Jesus of Nazareth, and who can be personally known and experienced. Lewis? Well, thank you. First of all, can I deal with the genetic fallacy? The fallacy is yours, not mine. You didn't understand my arguments at all. My point about genetics was not to, in order to explain um, uh, whether God exists or not, but I was trying to explain why people believed in God. It wasn't evidence for or against the existence of God. You totally misunderstood my, my, my argument. My argument against God's existence doesn't depend upon genes. It's the absence of evidence. And to use catchphrases as the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, I mean, that's philosophical bunkum. I mean, I'm terribly sorry. If God exists, you've actually got to find some real evidence. I'm terribly sorry, we scientists, do base the way we think on evidence. I mean, if I say that I think that you're a kangaroo because I dreamt you were a kangaroo last night, that is not evidence of the slightest importance. I think you really, really, if you want to go, you look for evidence, you've got to find evidence. And when I say, what has God done in the last 2,000 years? And his flip reply is, well, he made me religious. I'm terribly sorry, if you really want to take that seriously, um, you might as well say, well, Almost everything you've done has been determined by God, and I'm afraid that isn't evidence. You've really got to find something more plausible that God has done in the last 2,000 years in order to be even in the slightest bit persuasive. With regard to Jesus, I'm slightly out of my depth on the scholarship. The stuff I've read says it's totally unreliable, and there are many books that actually argue that, and I don't find that very useful. There's no reason. If you go to many societies, who have a stronger belief in God as Christians do, how would you persuade them that their beliefs are false whether, whereas yours are actually right? And when we go back to the Big Bang and we want to explain how it occurred, maybe the really true and reliable way to say is we don't know. You know, there's nothing immoral or unsacred in saying we just don't know. I mean, I don't think that that has really come into many philosophers' minds. We scientists, by contrast, do say sometimes, terribly sorry, we just at the moment don't know and may never know. But rather than say that, I'm afraid believers invent this mythical creature who has no basis, who, 
And when I say, how was God created, it's denied that this is, he is so amazing, it's a he, by the way, in a human form, he's so amazing, he didn't need a creator. The universe needed a creator, yes, but not God. Come on, you can't take that seriously in any way whatsoever. And as far as fine-tuning is concerned, I'm terribly sorry, it may be a very small probability, but that's tough luck. The fact that there is the probability at all is why we're here that all those constants fit with the actual functioning of the universe, that's the way it is. Yes, it's very improbable. Tough luck, you just have to live with it. Many things in life are very improbable and you have to live with them. You can't say they don't exist just because you don't like how, uh, how, uh, how, un, how, um, how improbable they are. And once again, when I come back to moral, I uh, see I've got here moral, moral values certainly can be uh, genetically um, determined. So I think what one really has to ask also, again and again, is you have to be reminded that all cultures believe in a God of some sort. And yet, and I say you Christians because I think most of you are Christians, believe that your God is the true God and theirs, of course, is a delusion. I think you really lie in bed at night and be sure, why are you so sure that your God is the true God and was not created by anybody, whereas the universe was, whereas their gods are totally unreliable and really totally deluded. I really cannot see, and I repeat it again and again, if one is to believe in God, one has to, first of all, go against an enormous amount of what we know about science in the world, that you've got to go into the world of the supernatural, which goes against everything we know about physics and biology, and I'm terribly sorry, I don't see how you can possibly go that way. Thank you very much. Bill? This is a uh, seven-minute rebuttal of the rebuttal of the rebuttal. Right. <laughs> well, I was rather puzzled by that last remark that in order to believe in God, you must go against modern science and, and the evidence, since the only scientific evidence we've heard in tonight's debate has been the evidence I've presented in favor of the existence of God. But what about those reasons to believe that belief in God is false? We both agree that it's irrelevant uh, barring the genetic fallacy, on how belief in God originates. So what about the argument based upon the absence of evidence for God? Well, I said the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. He said, well, that's just a slogan. The point is that in order to justify the belief that God does not exist, you have to have some sort of evidence or justification for that. Otherwise, it's possible that God uh, does exist. Um, even if all of the arguments for God failed, that wouldn't be evidence that God does not exist. Um, so that in order to provide some sort of justification for atheism, for thinking that belief in God is false, he needs to give some sort of arguments, not just say there's an absence of evidence. And in any case, I have presented the evidence in tonight's debate. What about the question, well, what caused God? In his last speech, Professor Wolpert says, well, the universe needs a creator, therefore God needs a creator as well. Not at all, that doesn't follow. Remember the premises of the argument I gave. Everything that begins to exist has a cause. Something cannot come into being out of nothing. But if something is eternal and timeless, then it doesn't fall under that first premise. It doesn't need a cause. Even atheists like Daniel Dennett recognize that if eternal verities exist, like numbers or mathematical objects, they don't need a cause because they never come into being. They don't begin to exist. And the concept of God is the concept of an eternal, self-existent, necessary being, and therefore the answer is simply that God is uncaused. He is self-existent. So in tonight's debate, we've not heard any good arguments to show that belief in God is a delusion, that that belief is false. Have we heard some good arguments on the other side to think that God does exist? Well, first I said God is the best explanation for the origin of the universe. And here Professor Wolpert says, well, we just don't know uh, what caused the universe. I'm afraid that escape route isn't going to work. Remember the, the theorem proved by Bord, Vilenkin, and Guth that showed that the universe had an absolute beginning at some point in the finite past it sprang into being out of nothing, all of space and time. 
Uh, that is all I'm using the scientific evidence for, is to prove that statement, that the universe began to exist. That is a religiously neutral statement that can be found in any textbook on astronomy and astrophysics. Certainly, my argument does not fall under his charge that it goes against science. On the contrary, the Christian who believes that the universe begins to exist finds himself comfortably within mainstream science. It is the atheist who wants to salvage an eternal universe who finds himself with the ba his back to the wall trying to find some way to avoid the conclusion of Big Bang cosmology and the bored Guth Vilenkin theorem. So if you agree with me that anything that begins to exist has a cause, and that the evidence indicates the universe began to exist, and it just occurred to me, don't forget the philosophical arguments I gave for that. Wholly apart from the scientific evidence, I gave philosophical arguments for the finitude of the past. Then you'll agree with me that there is a transcendent personal cause. What about fine tuning? Here, Professor Wolpert says, well, it's just chance, it's just dumb luck. Again, I don't think that will work because it's not just the probability or the improbability issue here, it's the probability of having a life-permitting universe. To give an analogy, suppose Bob is given a car for his birthday and the license plate has on it CHT4271. Now, there are millions of license plate numbers and that number is highly improbable, yet it would occasion no special interest. But suppose Bob was born on August 8, 1949, and he finds on his birthday car the license plate BOB8849. He would be obtuse if he just shrugged this off and said, oh well, nothing to be explained about that. Any number is equally improbable and there had to be some number on the car. But what makes this case different than the other? It is the combination of high improbability with an independently given pattern that results in what uh, design theorists call specified complexity. And it is that that tips us off to the fact that this is not due to chance, it is due to design. So again, the theist finds himself comfortably within mainstream science. It is not I tonight who am challenging mainstream science or saying that its conclusions are doubtful. On the contrary, I think mainstream science goes to suggest that there is a designer of the universe. The moral argument has never been addressed in tonight's debate, I'm sorry to say, and I think that if there are objective moral values, then we are logically committed to God's existence. As for the resurrection of Jesus, um, Professor Wolpert admits that this isn't his area of expertise, but he says believe him when he thinks these are unreliable. Well, why? I, I quoted from mainstream scholars saying that the majority, the consensus view of New Testament historians today is that the empty tomb, the post-mortem appearances, and the origin of the disciples' belief in Jesus are accepted facts about the historical Jesus, just like his crucifixion. So it seems to me that, again, I'm well within what the consensus of scholarship teaches on this. He says, well, why should we believe in your God? Uh, well, it's not my God. The question is, why should we believe in the God revealed by Jesus of Nazareth? And the answer is because Jesus claimed to be such a revelation of God, and he rose from the dead in vindication of that radical claim, and we've got good evidence for it. Finally, as to the personal experience of God, he says, well, God has to do something since the resurrection of Jesus in the last 2,000 years. I, I think God does do things miraculously in the world. I have no reason to think that God is not miraculously involved in the world. But I'm basing my evidence on the historicity of the resurrection of Jesus and on my personal experience of God. He's done something in my life, and that's enough for me to believe in him. And insofar as I have no good reason to think that belief is delusory or not veridical, I'm entirely within my rational rights to believe that the God I experience and know is in fact real. So for all of these different reasons, I think uh, the person who believes in the God revealed by Jesus of Nazareth is fully rational in doing so. In fact, I would venture to say that Christianity as a worldview stands intellectually head and shoulders above any other ism or philosophy of life that you might care to enunciate. And for that reason, I find myself enthusiastically a Christian theist. Well, we really have a problem about evidence. Say I say to you, and I think it's partly in Richard Dawkins's book, I believe there's a teapot going around the earth. 
very fast. I don't know any evidence against that. So do you think the teapot is really going around the earth? So there's the absence of evidence that the teapot is going around the world, uh, not going around the earth. So therefore the teapot is going around the earth. I think one's in a bit of a fix here. If you want to say that the teapot is going around the earth, you really require some evidence that there really is a teapot there. Or say that I imagine, or I tell you, that I've seen fish that can talk. Very good Afrikaans, I'm South African, you see. And they speak, yes, their dialect is not that good, but they speak very nicely. Would you not like a little evidence for this? And the absence of evidence surely would make you doubt it. So when we come to God, it's not a question, the absence of evidence that there is no God, the absence of evidence that there is a God. There's not the slightest indication of evidence of the kind that we would use in science in our day-to-day -day lives or the existence of this supernatural being again. I mean, you keep on saying, if I may say, that you need a creator for the universe, but you refuse to uh, allow that God himself should have been created. Uh, I find that I find that, that very weird. And when you say, oh, this all fits with science beautifully, I'm terribly sorry, you don't tell me about the science that God used to create the universe or the science that was used to create God. So I think this is all supernatural. If I were to be very rude, I would say mumbo jumbo. You won't like that. But I'm terribly sorry, these ideas are really no different um, to, them, to homeopathy or um, Oh, what do, you, what do you see when looking at the stars and you know, astrology and, 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 all, and all these things? It, it's really not using one's hard-based evidence to look at what the real facts are. And I keep on coming back that if there's a cause for the creation of the universe, there also has to be a cause for the creation of God. And that God should take on this human form, once again, is very difficult, to put it mildly, and is, goes against everything that we know in science. And if we come back to Jesus, I'm sorry, this is something that happened 2,000 years ago. It's a wonderful story, and I think, but I think the actual real evidence for someone coming back from the dead goes against absolutely everything we know about the nature of life, and therefore I regret to say I do not take it seriously. Sorry. Thank you. And our uh, final five minutes apiece in the... If they wish it, they don't have to have it, but if they do, off you go. Oh. Hmm. Five minutes to round it up before we have our discussion. All right, let's try to draw together the threads of this debate in my closing statement. You remember I said I was going to defend two contentions tonight. First, that there's no good reason to think that belief in God is false. And I don't think that we've heard any good arguments against the existence of God tonight. What about this claim that in the absence of evidence for God, you're justified in thinking there is no God. And he gives the example of the kangaroo and the teapot. You see, the failure of those illustrations is that the reason we don't believe that I'm a kangaroo is not because of the absence of evidence that I am a kangaroo. Rather, it is the presence of evidence that I am not a kangaroo. Like we have good evidence that I'm homo sapiens. <laughs> Similarly, the, the teapot example also fails because the reason we don't think there's a teapot in orbit around the Earth is not because of the absence of evidence for such a teapot. It's because we have good evidence that no such piece of China has been launched into space by us <laughs> or uh, that extraterrestrials have, have put it there. So it is the presence of contrary evidence. But tonight we've heard no contrary evidence against the existence of God. And so this is just an elementary logical point. A proposition is not shown to be false by the absence of evidence for it. The proposition could still be true in the absence of evidence for it. We just wouldn't know if it's true. Now, I've tried to fulfill my share of the burden of proof tonight and give evidence for God's existence. 
But all Dr. Wolpert has offered against God is that God needs a creator. I don't think I need to repeat the argument here. Everything that begins to exist has to have a cause, but a timeless, necessary, self-existent being cannot be caused. It would be incoherent, logically, to say God has a cause. So I think we've got good arguments uh, tonight for the existence of God, the fine-tuning in the universe, objective moral values. Just because the uh, resurrection of Jesus occurred 2,000 years ago doesn't mean the evidence is unreliable. What is crucial is not the time gap between the evidence and today. Good evidence doesn't become bad evidence just by receding into the past. What is crucial is the time gap between the events recorded and the first records of them. And as long as that time gap is short, it doesn't matter how far they are from the past. Good evidence doesn't become bad evidence simply by receding into the past. He says, well, it goes against science. Not at all. What science tells us is what lies within the natural capacities of nature. And it is certainly naturally impossible that someone should rise from the dead. That is to say, if Jesus rose from the dead, it must have been a miracle. And that's why I say it's evidence for the existence of God. Finally, let me conclude by saying just one more thing about the personal experience of God. I want you to know that I myself wasn't raised in a Christian home or even a church-going family. But when I became a teenager, I began to ask the big questions in life. Why am I here? What's it all about? And I began to search for meaning in life. And as I did so, I began to read the New Testament. And I was absolutely captivated by the person of Jesus of Nazareth. There was a ring of truth about his words that I had never encountered before, and an authenticity about his life that was just undeniable. And after a period of about six months of the most intense soul searching that I've ever been through, I just came to the end of my rope and I cried out to God. And I experienced this tremendous infusion of joy. And God became a living reality to me, a reality that I've walked with now day by day, year by year, for over 30 years. A reality that I believe you can find too if you will simply seek him with an open mind and with an open heart. So I'd encourage you, if you're here tonight and you're seeking to find God as a personal reality in your life, do what I did. Pick up a New Testament, begin to read it. And as you go home this evening, you're lying in bed awake before you fall asleep, ask yourself, could this really be the truth? Could the truth about reality be far more wonderful than I ever dreamt or imagined? Could there really be a God who loves me and has given his son for me that I might know him? Don't miss that. If that is true, it is the greatest news ever announced. So I would encourage you to do the same thing I did. Begin to search, begin to look, and, and ask God to reveal himself to you. I believe that it can change your life in the same way that it changed mine. As I said when I started, I'm slightly nervous about trying to persuade you to give up your belief in God. Um, not that I have any illusions that I will be able to do that, because I think it really does help you, and I think that the basis for your belief is the comfort that it actually does provide you, you with. Nevertheless, as a scientist looking at the world, one must never be frightened to look at the world as it really is. And when it comes to miracles, which we haven't really spoken about, and the only philosopher that I take seriously, and that's David Hume. And remember what David Hume said about miracles. No miracle should ever be believed in unless the evidence was so strong and so miraculous that it would be a miracle not to believe in it. And I'm afraid that isn't the case with regard to the resurrection of Jesus. And I can understand completely what has just been said about the comfort and the pleasure of believing in God. In fact, that's my total argument. I think it gives enormous comfort of, pe of people to have these beliefs. But that doesn't actually make God real. I'm terribly sorry about that. And I'm terribly sorry that I don't want to kind of go back all the way uh, 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 back to evidence again. But you really have to say that when someone says, oh, yes, God really helps with love, well, that's very good. I think Christianity has done very good things. It's also done some terrible things um, uh, uh, historically. So all I would really say is please examine your evidence with care and really think that if you really want to believe that God created the world, 
then you must give up your scientific beliefs because you're actually into the supernatural world for which there's absolutely no evidence whatsoever. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Lewis? All right. Come and, come and join us. Um, well, you should sit in the middle. No, I'm not, because it's like being at Wimbledon Centre Court. Then, and I'm doing that all the time. I'm going no, to sit here. Plus, you'd have to have your back to the audience, and you're more important than I am. <laughs> right. Um, tell me something, Bill. If, and clearly this didn't happen, at least I'm making an assumption here, if... Um, Lewis had succeeded in demolishing your arguments. I mean, I make the assumption that even from your perspective, you understand. I leave that to other people to make the judgment. If he had succeeded in demolishing your arguments, would your faith have remained intact? Yes, uh, both because my faith is not ultimately based on arguments, but also because I've got other arguments. <laughs> It, uh, it, it, I'm, I'm tempted to quote Cecil B. DeMille to you, you know, <laughs> asked about his principles. He said, gentlemen, those are my principles. If you don't like them, I got others. Yes. Well, <laughs> I, I mean that sincerely. In 20 minutes, you can only share a limited amount. And, and I do think there are other sound arguments for God as you well. You had a bit more than 20 minutes. Well, suddenly you had about 40 minutes. But there we are. <laughs> All right. All right, 40 minutes. Um, but, but, but the fact is, it wouldn't have matter what he said. In short, it wouldn't have mattered what he had said. Your faith would have remained intact. Yes. Right. So what's the point of the argument then? <laughs> well, it's not, uh, Lewis and I aren't here tonight to try to persuade each other. No, We're here to try to, to make this available for the public. And I think there are people out there who are searching and trying to find the meaning and purpose of life in the same way that I was. And it's, it's the public that we're interested in in bringing this and, and, and let me it. reverse the question to you, Lewis, though it's more difficult, obviously, in the case of somebody who doesn't believe. And that is, are you capable of believing in a supernatural God? That's to say, and it's a terribly difficult one, of course, but if, if, if Bill had succeeded in demolishing your argument, might you, is it conceivable that at the end of the evening you said, yeah, maybe you got a point. I'll go home, I'll do what you said, I'll read that New Testament again, I'll study the life of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus, and who knows, tomorrow no, I might be at no, your church. No argument would have mattered, but certain events could change my mind. A, a, a few miracles would certainly make me reconsider. <laughs> I mean, there's no question. <laughs> I, I would have to. I feel, I feel a few more resurrections, for example. <laughs> How, how, would, how many would, do you want as a matter of interest? Would yeah. certainly undermine a great deal of my beliefs. Would, yes. would one do? I mean, one would be a very good beginning. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, anybody in mind in particular that? Um... <laughs> well, I am thinking about myself at my age. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which um, takes us to the Pascal wager, I suppose. Um, <laughs> all right. What? What? Did he say absolutely nothing tonight to, to not shake you? Of course, obviously no, no. you're not shaken. There's no that pointless question. Did he say anything at all tonight that made you think, well, uh, there's something there? <laughs> no, no I, I, didn't, I didn't think these were very good arguments uh, that we heard tonight. But, but, uh, but all right, let, let, me, let me do my bit then. Yes. Um, he asked you endlessly to um, answer his question about what came before God. You tell us that God, without a shred of evidence, if I may say, <laughs> as, as an independent uh, chairman here, you tell us that God created the universe. You I gave an argument for that. Well, you gave an argument for it, you produced no evidence for it. <laughs> Clearly, because you can't, how no, can it? Anyway, no. all right, put that to one side. But what he wanted to know was yeah. uh, who therefore created God. Mm -hmm. Well, to answer that question again, but God is, by definition, a self-existent, timeless, necessary being. So if there is necessary a God, being. yes, if there is a God, let's just, we're, we'll talk about possibilities. If there is a God, there cannot be a cause of such an entity, any more than there can be a cause of the number seven or the property of being blue. Things that begin to exist, that come into being, have causes, but something that's eternal and Necessary. So God was always there, and at some point along the line, 
although there was no time then, so clearly I can't say at some point in exactly. time. Exactly, very makes good, it, that's uh, right. Which makes it mildly more difficult to pursue this, but nonetheless. Uh, but that's right. Yep. At, 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 at some point, um, God decided that he'd create this whole thing. Rather, I, I would say not that he decided, but at some point he did create the whole thing. Well, well presumably he decided, well, yeah, all right. He created the whole thing. Yeah. You haven't got a better explanation of why the universe came. Well, you don't know. You said I, I, so. Sorry, there's nothing to be ashamed about admitting ignorance. I don't understand the Big Bang. I vaguely, you know, I discussed it with people. And if there are things that we don't understand, we just have to say we don't know. What you, don't, is... you don't have to invent mystical creatures in order to do it. You don't have to invent mystical creatures. Sorry, no. You don't have to invent mystical creatures. No, I don't think you do. I just think you have to say you don't know and keep on trying to find out, and maybe we'll never find out. Yeah. And if you found it was a supernatural being? Oh, I'd be absolutely shocked, but I would change my mind. But I'd need what to think. A tiny bit of evidence would be a very good beginning. He's offered you evidence. No, says. that's not evidence. Oh. Certainly, oh, no, certainly a, oh, there's more than a tiny bit of evidence no, on the table not, that no. the universe began to exist. That's, your, that's total speculation. Uh, well, the astronomer royal Martin Rees would beg to differ with you. Well, he can beg if he wishes, and I like Martin very well. <laughs> in, in his book, Just Six Numbers, Martin Rees says... I know Martin that, well. Yes, well, and he says that the modern cosmology is as firmly established a science as the geology of the Earth. Yes. This is not a matter of airy-fairy speculation. Can I just... Now, now, we're, now we're back into the constants again. And you no, think... no, this is Big Bang, not fine-tuning we're talking about so, now. So what's the well, point? his book was on fine-tuning, but he makes this statement in the course of... What, that the Big Bang book. must have been caused by someone? No, that the... I bet he doesn't. No, he doesn't. No, no, what no, he, he what? takes an, ag an agnostic attitude as far as I know. Well, that's that. good. That's at least... A what, what, he, what he actually he said, what, 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 what Martin Rees actually does, as far as I can tell, and, and, and it's above most of us mere mortals, I think, so it's above me anyway, um, is he speculates on this possibility of the multiverse and, right. and the, uh, the idea right. of what's that ghastly film in which we're all just in a computer, the Matrix, isn't it? Right, right. And, and, uh, and he says we just could be kind of players in a... We, you and I argued this morning about the chess game. We used an analogy that eventually ran into the sand, and my fault that it was a hopeless analogy to begin with. But the, but the Matrix one isn't bad, and he, he conjectures that this, this designer is kind of playing a computer game really and where one of a million a billion a trillion universes and it just kind of happens that way as far as I can see I, I've read a bit of what he said I recall him saying God did all that oh no no not at all I, and he I, certainly didn't get into Jesus as no no the, certainly you know. not I, I was simply saying that this is not a mere matter of speculation that there's more than a tiny bit of evidence on but, the but table it's, but it's, he's yeah, saying but that, it's for what evidence for a beginning of the universe. Yes. Well, we know that. Nobody oh, right. Well, that's that. what I'm offering in this first argument, is that, the evidence. But, but, but because why? the beginning doesn't it. imply a God. <laughs> it does if the first premise is true, that whatever begins to exist has a cause. It logically follows. Yeah, that but, doesn't, but, but the cause hasn't got to be God. Well, remember I gave a, uh, an argument for thinking that this cause is timeless, yes, spaceless, immaterial, uh, enormously powerful, and personal. I think it's a computer. Well, that wouldn't... Uh, computers are designed by people. I no, mean, no, this is a self-designing computer. Uh -huh. Timeless. Timeless. Well, that's a contradiction in terms. Why is it time? What's contradictory about it? A, a computer has to function. It takes oh, time. Oh, no, this is a special computer. <laughs> yeah, but it has to be logically coherent. Oh, it's logically coherent. Yes, you have to be logically coherent. Oh, no, coherent. this and, computer and besides, is amazing. No, it, it, besides, it, it would have to be, as I said, a personal being. No. In, a computer is a physical Not this computer. Object. Oh, well, then, no. Okay. See, what you're doing is you're actually, what you're calling a computer is really God. A, a, a non-physical, <laughs> non... It's just, it's just another word if you rob it of all the attributes that make it a computer. Surely Gates is God. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Go on. You, what, go on with my computer? Yeah, yeah, yeah now, absolutely. I'm, I'm really saying... I mean, he's got a point when he no, says... He if what, you're, if what I'm you're... saying that I don't know what caused it. And he claims he does know what caused but it. You've, but he's saying more than that. He's saying you've got to prove. No, I don't have to prove. I have to admit ignorance. 
Well, if you admit well, ignorance and he admits right. knowledge, as it he were. He hasn't got knowledge. Well, though. but he, he believes he has knowledge. So oh, if, if, that's the whole if, nature if, of belief. If we, if we have two people, one of whom says, I don't know, let's, uh, I, God mm. almighty, I hate these, all these uh, absurd <laughs> examples, but I go to two doctors, right? One of them, and I've got a pain in my wherever it is, and the first doctor says, I've no idea what's causing it, clear off. And the other one says, actually, it's because you've got a pimple in your thingy. Well. You know, and, and, and moreover, because this is what his God does, and moreover, I can cure it, I'll go for the second doctor. No, but it's not saying a pimple in your thing. He's saying there's a really special, How do you know? unimaginable, you don't know supernatural doctor. thing <laughs> in your thingy. Well, That's see, a you, problem. You're, you're unwilling to accept the idea of anything that exists beyond nature. Yes. Well, that is begging the question in favor of atheism. That just is presupposing that atheism is true. And that's what the debate is about. Well, you're presupposing that God is true. Oh, no, not at all. I'm, I'm giving Ooh. arguments for God's existence. And well, what, I'm giving looking, Ooh. what I'm looking for is arguments for atheism. And this isn't, I mean, lots of atheists give arguments for their view. You know, the problem of evil and suffering in the world. Oh, no, and, that's a terrible argument. Well, I, I <laughs> yeah, that, that's what Richard, I notice that's what Richard Dawkins says too. Dawkins doesn't use it's that absurd. argument. But that is a, J.L. Mackey of Oxford, he used that argument. Oh, that, you must know, be a philosopher. Well, it, 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 may, <laughs> it, may, it may, Lewis, be a terrible argument, but it's a pretty powerful argument when you're arguing against a Christian God who's supposed to be all-merciful, isn't it? Um, you know, what, that there's, there, 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 there's suffering. evil and suffering. Mm. So you mean we must blame God for all the suffering in the world well, too? Well, I don't think that. I'm saying that atheists... So who, if not God? ...offer arguments for atheism, and this would be an example. The atheist can't get off the hook here. He, he, he's making a knowledge claim. But God not. does not exist. Oh, right. See, that's a knowledge claim. It's the agnostic who makes no knowledge I claim. I don't say God does not exist. I say there's no evidence for God. Or, well, then that's mere agnosticism. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, that, no, we that, atheists say we do not believe that God exists. Well, that, that, that's compatible with God existing, you see. No. That's mere agnosticism. No, no, the, it's not. Atheism says that God does not exist, which is a claim to know something and therefore requires justification. I'm terribly, this atheist doesn't say this. He just says there's no evidence for God. All right, well, how would you differentiate yourself then from an agnostic? Agnostic says I'm clueless as to whether God exists or not, and I'm a coward to try and make up my mind. Well, no, well, that's pejorative. The, 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 yes, says, it is pejorative, and I mean the, it to be pejorative. All right, what about the non-cowardly agnostic, like Bertrand Russell, say, who says, I, I don't know whether God exists, I don't know whether God does not exist. Well, that's, that's, a, that's a, agnostic, yes. Well, that's what you are. No. Well, <laughs> Good okay, Lord. Then, then give us, if you're, not, if you're not that, then you need to give us some warrant for the belief that there is no God. No, no, no. I just say Otherwise, that I know of no evidence or any reason to believe in God whatsoever. This is a supernatural being for which I know of no evidence, and he's done nothing that I know of in the last 2,000 years. Why did you lose your faith? Me? Mm. We know uh, why, we know why Bill, oh, it's, it's, how it's, Bill it's, found it's, it. It's, but... sh it's, it's shameful. Um, when I was young, I used to pray to God to help me with various things. My prayers weren't answered, so it was purely pragmatic. I gave it up. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, I, 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 Bills was a redhead beauty in the front row. I, you know, I mean, I, at least I may be slightly simplifying what you told me. Or exaggerating. Or, or possibly even. Listen, there is one basic, you may have basic laws forgotten things, and there is a basic law of journalism. And we all observe it, I promise you this. First simplify, then exaggerate. You know, I, I, <laughs> I hold to that. I, I, I hold it. So, where, where we are, and I mean, you, you, you use much of your book to, to deny the circularity of your argument. Um, what you've been trying to do tonight, forgive me if I've got this wrong, Lewis, is prove that it, it is in fact entirely a circular argument. Yes. Yes? Hmm? Yes. Hmm? Tell him why. Tell him why it's a circular Yeah. Why is a circular argument? Why, why is because you want, to you want to believe you need an explanation for things that you don't understand, like why the universe exists. Mm -hmm. And you're too frightened to admit that you don't know. That's not the definition of what a circular argument is. Well, it's circular-ish. <laughs> no, a, a circular <laughs> argument is when your only reason for believing a premise is that you already accept the conclusion. That's what you're doing when you say there's nothing beyond nature, there is no supernatural. That's presupposing no, but your atheism. Is circular. 
that because there had to be a creator, therefore the creator had to be God. No, I gave an argument. No, no, no I know, but I think that argument is totally false. Well, then what we you need to do, we don't want to get what you need to do, again. Professor Wolpert, is then to identify the false premise in the argument, because that, the that, logic is valid. The conclusion right. follows from the premises, so you have to show me which of the premises is false. The premise is that there had to be a personal creator of the universe. Okay, and then what, if you're going to argue that that's false, then you'll need to refute the two arguments that I gave for the personhood of the creator. Oh, yes, well, there's no evidence for the person. Well, I gave two. Oh, well, one, the moral one is absurd because there's well, no, plenty of morality. The... You don't believe that's not a strong one. What's the other oh, one? Oh, no, I think, well, that wasn't the argument for the personhood, though. The other arguments actually do give you a personal mm -hmm. creator and designer. The arguments were About that the... it must be a timeless and spaceless being and therefore cannot be physical or material. And the only things that we know of that can fit that description are either minds or abstract objects, and abstract objects don't cause things. The number seven can't cause anything. Therefore, the cause of the universe must be a mind. I'm very suspicious of anything that's timeless and spaceless. Well, you may be suspicious, but that's not really an argument or a reputation. I'm not, I'm not a good physicist on, yeah. on this. Well, all right, I mean, let's, let's get, let's get right. into, the, into the, the moral bit. Yes. Mm. Um, because uh, you, Lewis, um, offered us various illustration, illustrations, you, uh, various sure. arguments as to why we, we, can, we can arrive sure. at a moral state. Sure. And, and effectively, what you're saying, as I understand it, and you'll tell me I'm wrong, I'm sure, effectively you're saying uh, we do these moral things because over a long enough period we sure. have concluded that they're in our interest to do them. Absolutely. Right. Why do people do those things that are not in their selfish interest, but are clearly decent and good? Why do they sacrifice themselves in the cause of something from oh, which they will benefit nothing? We're, we're into the whole comp thing, you know, about people's behavior, how the brain works, about sociology, about um, mental illness. There are all sorts of complications. Have you so. never looked at somebody? Have you never met anybody? And it might be a, a Mandela figure, yes. or it might be a Mother Teresa figure, yeah. or it might be an, an, yes. an atheist, um, yes. and said, actually, I don't know this person terribly well, don't know him at all, don't know anything about his medical background, whatever, but he's a good guy, good person. Or no, I think most good my, person. No, I don't have to go to those great people. I can go to my partner and my a friends and say they're good people. Absolutely, you can, and you can say they're good people. Why are they good people? Because they help me a great deal, and I like them. Won't well, quite do in the case of Mandela. Sure. Is, is, that, is that the basis of your moral system? Because they help you? That they and help other people too. Okay, okay. So it's their behavior. There is nothing that you, you, you don't then go the extra step and say, why are they doing that? Well, that Even though it may sorry, not be in their no, best let, interest let, to do let, it. Let, let's be clear that we don't really understand how people behave or why they He's behave. He's offering you an explanation. Yep. What, by a god? Oh, come on. What about all Don't shout at me, it was his argument. <laughs> sorry, I won't shout again. I can behave badly at times. I'm sorry. <laughs> not at all, not at all. <laughs> um, no, to keep behaving but, badly. But there are lots of people who are criminals who do all sorts of terrible things, and we don't fully understand why they do all those things. And some, you know, people have breakdowns, they do all sorts of strange things, sure. Uh, could I clarify Please something do. about the argument? Because I think this is apt to lead to misunderstanding. My argument is not that belief in God is necessary in order to do good or live a moral life or be a decent chap. The argument has nothing to do about belief in God. The argument is that without God, there isn't any absolute standard of right and wrong, and therefore what we call moral values are just the spin-offs of sociobiological evolution. Altruism, like you mentioned self-sacrificial behavior, a mother rushing into a burning no, building. No, 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 specifically not a mother to save a child because there's a perfectly good reason for a mother saving well, the child. Well, but if you think, if you say that, see, then again, you're, you're still misunderstanding my argument. What I was going to say is that on the sociobiological point of view, that kind of altruistic behavior is just the selfish gene wanting to perpetuate mm. itself. Mm. And it's the same kind of behavior you see in a troop of baboons where you see what looks like altruistic behavior, or even in an ant heap, where fighter ants will sacrifice themselves for the good of the heap. M my point is that on the atheistic view, that's all moral values are. Is that right? Let's clear that. And I, I would like to. Is ask there any difference, Lerma? You come back in one second, but let me just ask Lewis whether there is any difference between the altruistic behavior of a human being, somebody who may sacrifice him or herself 
for a cause which, which will bring them no particular benefit, and, and, and a baboon in a troop. Well, there are, there are occasions where there are groups of animals where there's someone who will, sc will scream when danger comes, mm. and therefore all the thing. So these can be biologically determined, but also there's the whole complex of the nature of the sociology of the society and how different societies behave. And that's got nothing to do with God, that's complex sociology and biology. Oh, so and and exactly who imposed the complex biology? Where did that come from? Well, evolution, because, evolution. Right. Yeah, we're back to the old... No, 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 see, that, that's my argument. That is all that moral values are on, on atheism, and that therefore, as I say, rape, child abuse, these yeah, may be socially me. inconvenient, but, or, or so taboo. As an but atheist, I'm not a rapist. You're misunderstanding my argument. Of course yes. you're not. Thank you. you're, you're misunderstanding the argument. If, I'm not arguing that to be, be a good person, you have to believe in God. What I'm arguing is that without God, there is no absolute moral values, no absolute moral duties. We are like advanced primates, uh, and what we call moral values are just these ingrained sociobiological patterns. Yes, that's exactly what they are. Okay, so, so that is your view. I was, I was not sure of that. Well, then you see, when you make these moral judgments yourself, you're, you're acting inconsistently with your own worldview. When you make moral judgments like wow. everyone has the right to believe whatever he wants so long as it doesn't interfere with others. Where do these, where's this notion of rights suddenly come from? The, the, that's just... History and sociology. Right, just sociologically ingrained yes. behavior. So the, uh, the pedophile or the rapist or the psychopath or the person who wants to be uh, a, a religiously intolerant persecutor is just acting uh, out of fashion. He's like the person who belches no, not at a not, meal. No, uh, Hitler, Hitler wasn't acting out of fashion. He acted in his particular way, which other people objected to. Right, but there wasn't anything morally wrong with what he did, right, on your view? Of course there was. It, well, it was just, uh, it was just contrary to uh, the patterns of sociobiological behavior that have been ingrained into the human species no. not to kill each other off. Why, why was what he did objectively wrong? Because it, made, it killed many people and made people extremely uh -huh. unhappy. All right, but now that goes on all the time in the animal kingdom, right? No. Killing other, other no, animals. No, it does not. Well, when a lion kills a zebra... Oh, when a lion kills a zebra... He kills it so eat, What it? about when you kill your, 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 your turkey? Be careful yes. with turkeys at the moment. <laughs> yes. Well, uh, fine, use, use that example. Uh, on, on atheism, these are all morally neutral acts because there isn't any standard of right and wrong. Sure, there isn't. Okay, so <laughs> then, you agree with, with, with me that what Hitler did, there wasn't I, 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 You've lost me a bit here, I confess, you're, because you, you do seem to be saying that, that if you're an atheist, you, you, you're an immoral person. No, 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 no. You, you, I mean, you, what is, listen to the argument again. Yeah, if God does not exist, yeah. then objective moral values do not exist. Lewis agrees with that. Uh, moral no, 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 values no, no, on this. No, he doesn't. Of course he no, doesn't. He doesn't. Yes, he does. He just said, just there said are no, so. They there are, are merely no external moral values, yes. There are no external moral Well, all right, yes. define what you mean by an external moral you know, value. Coming from outer space it, and Precisely, God. exactly. Yes. So, yes. But what, what you do believe is that within us... There is a moral there value. There is clearly Absolutely, a moral framework. Yes. That's, I mean, so, so you, I think you do misrepresent him a bit there. Well, I, mean, I, I, I think not, because if you were to rerun the film of evolution, uh, and uh, quite different creatures might have evolved having quite a different set of, of moral they might values. Have, but they I doubt didn't. it. Right. And, and if that were the case, there would be no way that one of them could say, our values are right and your values are wrong. Or, or even among cultures. Why, how can you say that National Socialist Germany was wrong and that the liberal democracies are right? It's, it's right according to our point of view, sure. but according to them, it, it's right according sure. to their point. Do, do you, you, Everything you, becomes relative. You, uh, Lewis, is it your contention that, these, that this moral framework under which we operate, whether with respect, whether we are atheists or agnostics or theists, the moral framework under which all societies I think it's true to say that all, um, is it true to say that all human societies have some form of moral framework, maybe different from ours, yes. but, but they have one. I mean, cannibals presumably think it's okay to eat each other because, well, it's okay to eat each other, <laughs> I suppose. I don't uh, think cannibals do eat each other, do they? They don't any longer, I think they've stopped. <laughs> yeah, I think they prefer they? McDonald's, but it's, it's <laughs> which, according to Prince Charles today, is even worse, I think, but I don't want to be quoted on that necessarily. But, <coughs> 
but, but, but where did it come from? What? The, the, moral, the, moral... The, 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 the thing that is inherent in us, that you tell us is inherent in us, where did it, how did it arise? Well, best from evolution, there's certainly altruism came from evolution, that you, you certainly wanted to help those with the similar genes to, uh, to yourself. And also from uh, reciprocity, in other words, if you were in a society where if you behaved well, then the other people would behave well. And people learned that, that you could do much better if you behaved well to them. Why, why then do we, I can see why we would help others with the same genes. But why, why do we get big, I'm out of my depth then, I don't think we under, that's big sociology and politics well, and you economics. Well, my question, it was going to be why, why do we care about the, the, the mistreatment of kittens or, well, kittens because they've got big eyes, I suppose, but, well. but I don't know, ugly animals or something. Because we identify with them. With animals? Yes. We are an animal after all. And that's it. I mean, the idea that God created us quite separately from all other animals is absurd. Do you know how animal we are alike? I'm a dog at heart. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, animal, rock, animal, animals, <laughs> animals are not moral agents. Well, when, a, when, a, when a lion kills a zebra, it kills it, but it doesn't murder it. When a hawk steals a fish from the talons of another hawk, it takes the fish, but it doesn't steal the fish. None of these have any moral dimension to them. And it's the same with human behavior on this oh, atheistic no, view. So. We're just relatively advanced primates. And there really isn't any objective right or wrong. It's just evolution. Good, yes. Yeah, and I submit that's morally abhorrent. Why, why, why is that? Now, that's interesting. Why, why morally abhorrent? Because torturing a child for fun is wrong. But he's not saying it isn't wrong. Y yes, he is. He's all, all he's saying is that it goes against the patterns that have been ingrained into Homo sapiens into this herd morality by evolution. But there isn't any objectivity to that. Animals yes, kill I mean, their, their young all the time. Infanticide goes on all the time in the animal kingdom. And well, we're just they're, animals. They're terribly on sorry. Infanticide does not go on all the time. Well, I, I, I beg to differ. I mean, many animals will kill their own young. What for? I, I, I leave that to a biologist to explain I'm sorry, that. most animals do not kill their own young. I, I, they might kill I, somebody I else's young. No, yeah. it's simply not true. Well, they sometimes right, they they kill each other. When did you last right. see a dog kill a puppy? I haven't seen that, but I have seen mice do this with, you know, pet, pet mice do this kind of thing. It was very awful. Maybe you should have... <laughs> I was going to say maybe you should have fed them, but uh, that's... Yeah. <laughs> That's probably about. All right, look, we've got, we've got three minutes left. Um, <laughs> there is clearly nothing that either of you can say to persuade each other no. as to your beliefs. Yes. Um, is, there, is there any ground that, that, that you both occupy? Is there anything? That, that this is the, the despair. This is the most difficult debate you can chair because there is simply no you're right. Starting. Because our concept of science is totally different. You're, oh, you're, it is not. But, oh, I, it is. I was thinking, where, I thought you were going to ask, where is the common ground? And I thought, well, at least we're right. both well, committed. I, I, was, I was going to go, and I'll ask you I, that I then. thought at least go. we're both committed to the value of logic and science. Neither of us is some kind of wacky postmodernist who denies the objectivity of science and, and logic. I and, would say you are. Well, you, you would be mistaken then. Uh, you would be mistaken, and, and anybody who thinks that doesn't understand contemporary cosmology. Because what do you say to your um, creationism? I'm right in the mainstream. The, the, the rise of creationism well, I, I, in the I United States. I disagree with young earth creationism. I, I, I don't think it's taught in the Bible, and I don't think it's scientifically tenable. So, you, so, so this is a very substantial section of, of the Christian community in the United States who has simply got it wrong. I think so. Why, no. why, why might you not be wrong in exactly the same way that they are wrong? Well, because I think that uh, when you look at Genesis chapter 1, it's, n it's a much more subtle theological document than what young earthers tend to but believe. But you're quoting the Bible now as though it was some peer-reviewed scientific... <laughs> no, what I'm, what I'm saying is that I said I thought they were both wrong in interpreting the Bible to believe that the world was created 10,000 years ago in six literal days. And that's a question of exegesis. And I'm saying I think their interpretation, though possible, isn't the most plausible. But then the second, I think there's just overwhelming scientific evidence for uh, the geological timetable and the astronomical age of the universe. So, well, what about evolution of human beings and things like I'm, that? I'm, I'm open to the evidence on that. I honestly am. I'm, I'm, but not persuaded? Not yet. I think there are some problems. So you don't believe in evolution? 
No, but I don't disbelieve it either. I am genuinely agnostic about that. I think that microevolution is well established, but the extrapolation from micro to macro evolution is a huge extrapolation that doesn't have very, if any, compelling evidence for it, and there's some very good evidence against it. So I am, I'm genuinely open-minded to be convinced on this. Uh, I, don't, I think as a Christian, I can be more objective than Lewis on this score because I can follow the evidence where it leads. But for the naturalist, you see evolution is the only game in town. So no matter how improbable, he's got to believe it. All right. I uh, don't have to believe it. The evidence is excellent. Do you believe in intelligent design at all then? Yes, the argument that I gave based on fine-tuning is a form of the intelligent design argument. So you are a creationist? In the Very sense that I yes, believe yes, that yes, God yes. created the universe, yes, but I'm not what is called but sometimes a develop- young earth creationist, which well, is the way that term is often well, understood, understood. Un- un- underused. But you don't think that evolution could have created human beings by I'm, random I'm, events? I'm, I'm agnostic about that. I, I'm rather inclined to the view that God uh, has intervened periodically in the process of microevolutionary development to bring about changes that nature left to its own devices wouldn't have produced. So if there are 10,000 beetles, God had his hand there? I, I wouldn't necessarily say that, but I, I, for example, that sponges and bats would have a common ancestor is so enormously improbable that oh, the Oh boy, sun, are you ignorant. The, the, well, oh my God. I, Sorry, I, what, what, uh, what in the, Sponges. The, sponges. The sponges right. and bats have both evolved by random mutation and natural selection from a common ancestor is an extrapolation that goes so far beyond the evidence, and it is so improbable that the sun would have probably ceased to be a a main sequence star and would have incinerated the earth before it occurred. I want to say that I fundamentally disagree with you that the evidence for precisely that is excellent. Mm -hmm. All right, we're not going to agree on that. A final, I think, <laughs> I'm taking a wild guess here. Um, a, 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 final, a final thought from you, Lewis. Um, evidence of your eyes is a couple of thousand people in here, many of them young, most of them, I think, probably quite young. Um, all of them, most of them, Christian. maybe all of them bright. Well, let, yeah. I was going to come to that right at the very end. They're at university, most of them. They're intelligent people who've given this a lot of thought, I assume and they have come to a different conclusion from you. Yes. I don't think they have given it a great deal of thought. I think that they... (laughs) I don't think they've given it a great deal of thought along the lines that we've been discussing here, and I think that has helped them a very great deal. So it all comes down in the end to a comfort blanket. My little boy's got his little comfort blanket with a bit of... That's it, it's a comfort blanket. Yes. Sorry, yes. Sorry. <laughs> I think that's probably the last word. <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you both, thank and you thank you all very much indeed. Yes, thank you.